The use of p-values and q-values as a way of indicating the significance of results in genomic analyses and elsewhere is commonplace. It is easy to use arbitrary cutoffs, but until recently I'm not sure I'd really understood them. This video is inspired by an article I found on the website of Nonlinear, a company that specialises in mass spectrometry and 2D protein expression analysis methods. I would advise looking at their article for yourself, from the horse's mouth as it were. What I'm presenting is my interpretation of the material, which I mainly prepared to help solidify my own understanding, but hopefully this will help you as well. Imagine you have the results for a microarray experiment and you want to know which genes are expressed in your treated cell line compared to an untreated one. There are three treated biological replicates and three untreated biological replicates. Replicates are good for estimating the variance in the results, i.e. the range over which expression values fall. The results that you have are normalised expression values for each probe set. The probe sets are a set of clustered probes that are commonly situated at the three prime end of gene transcripts. A statistical test compares the mean of the expression values in the treated sample compared to the mean expression of values in the untreated sample. The difference between the means of the samples may be large, but therefore so is the overall spread or variance of the expression values giving a non-significant result. Whereas other samples may have a small difference in the mean expression, but low variance indicates that the genes in the samples are significantly expressed when treated. In case you are unfamiliar with this type of graph, it is called a box plot. It gives details about the spread of data. In this case, the expression values for a particular probe set in the six replicates. The horizontal bar shows the median value, and the thick vertical bars above and below show the upper and lower quartiles. The whiskers indicate the range of values high to low. The p-value for each result provides a measure of how likely you would see this result if the so-called null hypothesis was true. In this example, the null hypothesis is that there is no difference in expression levels between the two groups of samples. A small p-value, typically less than 0.05, says that there is a small chance of getting this result, even if there is really no result at all. By choosing a p-value cutoff of 0.05, we are accepting that there is a 1 in 20 or 5% chance that there is in fact no real difference and we are merely looking at an experimental artefact. A p-value of 0.05 is a widely accepted cutoff, but others may use lower values such as 0.01, which indicates a 1 in 100 or 1% 1 chance that the result is a false positive. These are good odds, but if many such tests are being performed at the same time, the number of false positive results would be unacceptably high. For example, there are over 20,000 or so probe sets on an expression array. Applying this to our example, there could be as many as 1,000 false positive results. Now the p-value could be lowered, but there is then a risk of unnecessarily throwing away real results. There are different methods that attempt to correct for the effect of performing multiple tests by assigning an adjusted p-value. One of the best known methods is the Bonferroni correction that multiplies the p-value by the number of tests performed. This is widely accepted as being too conservative resulting in the loss of real results, so-called false negative results. Alternatively, there is the false discovery rate, formalised by Benjamini and Hochberg in 1995. Simply stated, P 
the approach only tries to control for false positives in the significant results. So here is the important difference. A p-value of 0 0.05 implies that at least 5% of all tests will result in false positives, whereas a false discovery rate adjusted p-value of 0 0.05 implies that 5% of significant tests will result in false positives. The Q value formalized by Story in 2002, which makes it a relatively recent method, is a false discovery rate procedure that has been optimized by taking into account the distribution of p-values in an experiment. Now I apologize for the quality of uh, figures here as they've been copied from the website I mentioned at the beginning of the video. Figures A, B and C are density plots where the area under the columns is equal to 1. The first column represents the number of p-values 0 to 0 0.05 moving along to the last column which represents p-values 0.95 to 1. In an experiment where there are no significant changes, shown in figure A, you would expect to see an even distribution of p-values, whereas in an experiment with significant changes, shown in figure B, you would expect to see many more significant p-values. The q-value is calculated by estimating the height at which the p-value distribution for an experiment flattens out and is used in the calculation of false discovery rate adjusted p-values. This can be seen in figure C. So in effect, the q-value helps to identify how many of the significant results in the green area are false positives, the red area. Bear in mind that this is a highly simplified explanation of the whole procedure. If you took your list of results and ordered them by p-value, the q-value would be similarly ordered. My personal revelation was that to properly interpret q-values, you need to consider the ordered list of q-values as a whole. Looking in an imaginary ordered list of 20,000 expression array probe sets, the hundredth has a p-value of 0.01 and a q-value of 0.015. The p-value tells us that there is a 1% chance of false positives, so over 20,000 probe sets we would expect 200 false positive probe sets, potentially the entirety of our top genes. However, the q-value of 0.015 means we would expect 1.5% of all probe sets with a Q value less than this to be false positives. As 100 probe sets have a Q value of less than 0.015, we would only expect 1.5 false positives. So that's 1.5 false positives expected using the Q value and 200 if we use the p-value. So depending on the experimental setup and the success of the array experiment, the q-value may also indicate that there are many more false positives than predicted by p-value alone. In this situation, the validity of the experiment or the suitability of the comparison should be questioned. So when you are presented with a huge spreadsheet of results, it can be more helpful to look at the entire ordered list of P and Q values. This is especially true when deciding on a threshold value to determine what section of the results is significant or not. It is best to see how many false positives are expected as a result of the chosen threshold rather than arbitrarily choosing P or Q values of say 0 0.05. Finally, uh, here are the links of sources used to find this information. Uh, if you have any comments on this video, 
uh, anything you don't understand or anything that's just plain wrong please let me know thanks